Hello and welcome. My name is Chris Campbell and I am with WDET and NPR and I'd like to welcome you to a special program here in which we're going to be able to dialogue about what's happening in the world today. The name of this program is called Needle Drops and as a sub theme it involves electronic music's role in inspiring artistic movement and social change. And uh, one thing about 2020, I don't know about you, but 2020 has been a year of global pandemics and a year of social change and upheaval. Uh, I think when historians go back and look at 2020 and what it stood for, this will be the year where just a lot of things change. Uh, it's very much like a reset. But despite all the upheavals and things that are going on in the world, Music is what binds us, it helps to connect us, and really it helps us to make sense of it all. And so in today's uh, dialogue and forum, we're gonna be talking with some uh, global music figures who will sort of give us their thoughts on music's ability to inspire social change, but also using our respective platforms to uh, see what we can do to raise awareness about various forms of social and cultural advocacy. So with that said, we're going to welcome our esteemed panel, and we'll start it off by saying what's up to Mr. Carl Craig. What's, what's up? up? What's up? Here we Stephen are. Pullen. How you doing, my brother? Greetings, greetings. All good, yeah. All right, DJ Mix. Hey, what up, though? All up. right. <laughs> and lastly, coming in from LA, Seth Troxler. How are you, sir? Hey, guys, how are you? All right. Uh, I want to give a quick shout out and acknowledgement to uh, the sponsors of this program. This is sponsored by Movement and hosted by the Detroit Techno Foundation. So kudos to both of those entities. All right, well, let's get into it. We got some conversating to do. Um, when we talk about social upheaval and uh, global change, it seems like the incident involving George Floyd really was a tipping point in inspiring not only a lot of social protest and upheaval here in the States, but also a lot of um, attention overseas. Uh, Carl, we'll start with you. Well, what were your feelings when you first heard about that George Floyd incident? Unfortunately, it was, you know, just another time when this has happened. I mean, you know, another black man that just loses his life for no reason. And, uh, you know, I, I, felt, I felt upset. Um, but you know, there's a numbness that comes from it too, because you see it so often that, you know, it's, it's hard to really, to really express that, that anger or frustration, because you know that it's not the first time and that it's not going to be the last time either. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, moving on to Stacy, what were your initial thoughts? Well, when I first saw the video, the only thing was on my mind is, you know, if he, when he was on his neck, if he was such a threat, why did he have his hands in his pocket? Just the whole, for me, that, that really rubbed me wrong the way he looked. Yeah. You know, those eight minutes and 46 seconds of George Floyd's life has been the most significant since Dr. King's death, Rodney King issue when he got uh, assaulted and I would even say Emmett Till's death back in the day, you know, mm, right. you know, because they've contributed to the last riots that happened on race in this country. You know, mm -hmm. George Floyd's death is now being, in my opinion, is being used as a, as a catalyst for the movement to call for change regarding race relations, not just here, but worldwide, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, let's get a, uh, a woman's perspective on what went down. Minx, what were some of your initial feelings and emotions when you first heard about that incident? Well, my mother sent that video to me and uh, she just had a sad face on the video. And so I looked at it and it was, it was a very long video for me because the emotions that went through me, it was so much pain. Mm -hmm. um, looking at him pleading for his life and calling his mom and I was I was crying pretty much because I wanted him to stop. I wanted him to, you know, let up on him. But like Stacy said, he had his hand in his pocket like he was comfortable with it. And every time, you know, Mr. Floyd moved, he made sure that he adjusted himself as well to make sure that he kept his knee right. Oh, that was so painful. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it was pivotal. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Seth, 
uh, what were your initial feelings towards uh, hearing or seeing that? I, mean, I, I can really just echo the emotion of everyone else here. I mean, it obviously was disturbing. I mean, it's it's insane that it's taken these many events and to kind of wake people up. You know, I think I mean it was when I when I saw it, I was this, obviously like the screams for his mother really resonated to to me. Yeah. But one thing I I think is different with Floyd rather than it was, you know, the children that have been killed or any other incident is right now, because of the pandemic, everyone's stuck at home. So it was the first time that everyone had to actually confront what yeah. was going on rather than get on with their normal everyday lives and mm. go to the restaurant or do this and do that. So it's the first time that everyone else is kind of funny to me. I've seen that like people are like, Oh, this is a new, this is a thing. Like everyone's like, and it's like, this has been a thing. Right. <laughs> right. So it's, a, like, it's been a thing my whole life. And, it's been a, a real, a real issue, like in the past, in the recent years, you know. Yeah. And it's kind of, it's kind of amazing to me to see. It's it's beautiful to see everyone kind of coming behind the cause, but it's also kind of funny that this was the one thing that kind of tipped tipped the scale, which I'm I'm happy for. But I think there there's been just so many countless murders that it's yeah, at some point you just become numb, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, this uh, particular conversation, uh, we're going to be talking about social change and uh, using our respective platforms to really have an advocacy or cultural awareness about it. But this is also a celebration of music because uh, within social change, music is always connected with that because it always helps us to articulate. And really, some of the best music has come out of major social upheavals, some of the ones that we've seen already. So let's get into talking about music. One thing about all of you as DJs, you're international nationally renowned, globally recognized DJs, but you all have roots in Detroit, Metro Detroit. So let's talk about growing up in Detroit and uh, just describe some of the social conditions that influenced you along with the techno and electronic music artists that influenced you as well. We'll start uh, off with, uh, we'll start with Seth with this one. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm actually not from Detroit. <laughs> As, um, I'm from, I'm from Kalamazoo, Kalamazoo, man. Kalamazoo, you know, Kalamazoo, exactly. I'm from Kalamazoo, and then I grew up in uh, in Lake Orion, a okay. suburb of Detroit. You know, I worked at Melodies and Memories in the city for a long time, and you know, obviously started my uh, career in in Detroit. But um, it's a, it's a it's close enough. But it's also a very different experience. You know, like I can't. I, I I've never denied that and and also being possibly from the suburbs has helped my career as well and and being in some ways also being a lighter skinned black person in some ways being like when i went to move to europe um something that like i guess european culture more related to in some ways rather than <laughs> coming from a more urban background i mean my family in detroit is from the project my Jew, but at kalamazoo and like i come from still the typical black family experience in america but it, it is a very different experience coming from the suburbs than what you guys have, have all faced being in Detroit, going to cast, and you know, also being older. You know, I'm, I'm 35, and uh, I mean, times have changed a lot now. But when I was growing up, uh, I guess some of the race issues that you guys experienced in the, the riots and everything else and, and the things that happened before uh, weren't as much of a um, – not what, what wasn't as, as much on me. So – yeah, it's it's very different, you know. I mean, obviously, I mean the people I'm speaking to now are the people who influenced me, <laughs> like literally when I was a right. kid, right. growing right. up, listening to Meek's play, Stacy, Carl, like all this music. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be here without any of these people, and and without being part of the Detroit techno kind of legacy, you know. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm very thankful to be able to be able to be part of that, and to be able to have grown up in in Detroit electronic music scene. But also, I'm from. The suburbs, so that's that's something that I think should be noted. Yeah, different dynamic with that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Definitely. Now pivoting over to Minx, uh, you're actually part of the baby boomer generation, so you you have an even expanded outlook on some of the social uh, happenings in the city. Uh, talk about what it was like growing up in Detroit for you, and then kind of bring in the music piece. Uh, what influenced you musically as well? Well, growing up in Detroit. Uh, born and raised here. The rest of my family are all from the South. So uh, we pretty much, um, I was on the Northeast side of Detroit and the music we listened to all the time was R&B. I didn't even know anything about the electronic music scene until I moved downtown. Um, 
and I heard about Derek May on the radio. So once I heard that music, that's you know, I kind of got stuck on it and went to the Music Institute and fell in love with it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's when I decided that I wanted to, you know, actually play electronic music. Um, so, you know, I did have some mentors as well that I looked up to and actually Carl was one of them. I'm not just saying it because he's here, but he was one of them that helped me uh, along the way, um, Kevin Saunderson and Derek May. So it was a lot of people that I could actually look up to. Um, uh, the riots and things like that, I did hear about them uh, growing up, but never experienced anything like that. Um, as a woman, once I started to be a DJ, I did have a bit of a uh, issue a few times. It was it was a bit challenging, I'll say that, because it was looked at as a man's thing. So mm-hmm. people gave me a hard time a lot, you know. Um, I didn't get the benefits that the gentleman got, we'll just say that. But, you know, mm-hmm. I had to just get through the best way I could to fight for my respect. Yeah. So this is where I am now. It took a bit of time, uh, but uh, I'm here. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, we're going to move up to Stacy and Carl. We'll take Stacy first uh, because you guys uh, were part of that, that second wave of techno artists coming out of Detroit. And you've got some integral connections uh, with that first wave as well. Yeah. Talk about uh, some of those artists that influenced you and then kind of against the backdrop of what was going on in Detroit from a social perspective as well. We'll start with you, Stacey. Well, obviously there was a lot of music that was inspired and influenced from the radio here. I yeah. mean, you got all the guys, you know, who had radio shows, you know, including the infamous Electrify Mojo. Mm-hmm. But one thing that I think that was really important is that you re, at the in, back in the days you were able to record in real time yeah. the, the music that was played on the radio and relive those moments. Yeah. You know, and that's what got you inspired. You know, because you would go back to those those cassette tapes that you made. You know, from from Mojo's show and go listen to those records and or, or those tunes or the interviews that he did. You know, or go back to Derek May edits and things like that, and and be able to be get inspired from those those moments. You know, so that was that was a real special time. I still have some of those cassette tapes. You know, um, so but you know when when I first started, you know, of course I was in school at the time when the whole Detroit techno community started forming. You know, and I used to make eight hour trips home from Tennessee from Nashville to go to to Music Institute. And, you know, it was more of a it was a membership thing, you know, because we all had membership cards. We all used to dress nice. So it was that 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 sense of um, freeness and, and bond that we felt when when it came to, to the music. And, you know, and fast forward a couple of years later, I got to meet, meet Derek and, and, and Carl and Kevin and, you know, and, you know, Kevin and I and, and a couple of more guys we did. We had a, we formed a remix team. You know, we started doing remixes together with, with, with Kevin. And um, so, but we always had in the back of, in, in the back, we always had the black music, jazz influence that was influenced, that was inspired by us because we knew what those guys did back in the 50s and 60s, going over to Europe, coming back to the states, and being able to create and and and, and be creative individuals. Absolutely. And then Carl Craig, talk about your music experiences, but also talk about what it was like socially as you were being influenced by the music. Right. So Detroit is um, I, when I did my radio show the other day, we uh, did it as a protest uh, show and the majority of the music uh, was older music from from um, uh, the first part of the show. And a lot of it was from Motown and Motown was really um, pivotal for uh uh, protest music, it seems, you know, with with Marvin Gaye, with Stevie Wonder, uh, but also they had labels like Black Forum, and uh, I can't remember some of the other ones that they had. But there, you know, there there was a lot of um, of impact from what they were doing as a as a corporation uh, musically, especially a corporation that uh, that catered to not being political. 
Um, they released uh, 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 a couple of Martin Luther King speeches on vinyl. I think they did the mar March on Washington, and I think they did his uh, march here in Detroit as well. So we have that legacy in Detroit, whether we liked Motown or not, especially from, you know, uh, uh, me and Stacy were born, born pretty much uh, a couple of weeks different difference in time. And, um, you know, when, when I was interested in making electronic music, especially after uh, reading articles with, with Juan Atkins, where he's, where he's like, you know, I'm not trying to be Barry Gordy to say, you know, forget about Motown. We're doing, we're doing techno, you know, that kind of thing. So there was, there was a thing to kind of, of reject what was happening before us musically and make this new frontier of music that we were following uh, Juan, who was who was the leader, but Derek May, who was actually the leader, <laughs> and then and then Kevin, you know, on onward. So yeah, uh, the radio show, the radio was was really important, and I think the radio, uh, and I still think that radio should be a community project. It should not be a corporate endeavor. There should be community in radio, like in France, they have it where I think there's a certain amount of records, a certain amount of music on French radio that has to actually be French. Yeah, that's, that's okay. you know, and we don't have that because we look at this as a corporate, a corporate yeah, yeah. thing, as, as a as a a thing of making money. Now, uh, when when uh, when I used to just go out and see guys playing in the street, playing basketball and stuff. And they were playing this music, this electronic music that was that was like it was tripping me out. And um, uh, everyone was calling it progressive at the time. And progressive right. was right. was uh, 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 Gino Socio dancer and you know Italo disco and that kind of stuff. But also you know Goodbye Kiss and Triangle of Love, which were Detroit records. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I knew the electro stuff from from Juan and things. So there was this movement that was going on. Now, one one thing that that uh, shocked me when I watched the documentary because you know this was the crack days and this was when there were drive by shootings and and all these things that were were going on, which is which is absolutely horrible. But uh, uh, when I watched the documentary on White Boy Rick, and White Boy Rick was a drug dealer from Detroit that I don't even think he was a major player, but he is exactly my and Stacy's age. Mm -hmm. And that fool has been in jail for <laughs> you know, 35 years or something. Oh, a teenager. And since he was six, or 17 years old, and I think about that, yeah. and since we were exactly the same age, if Stace and I would have been involved in drugs or done anything at that time, it's very possible that we would have missed our chance for making music and being part of this movement, this musical movement. You know, so I mean, I I I think that we're blessed because we have. Uh, we have been able to, you know, keep our noses out of trouble, but also to be at the right place at the right time to, you know, uh, gain uh, our our careers. Yeah. Like I mean, I have to say, I actually, my mom moved me from Kalamazoo because I was hanging out with the wrong kids. Right. And then into Lake Orion, in this suburb of Detroit, for exactly that, to keep me out of trouble. And it was through techno. That really saved my life. So mm -hmm. it's this is like a it's a real thing, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's something about the music that uh, it, Detroit, you know, really curated that, and it spilled over into the rest of the world. And then let's talk about just from a global perspective, because you all are globe trotting DJs have been able to tour the world several times and be ambassadors for the music. But in terms of like social change, racism, what are some of the major differences that you see? Uh, here in the States compared to overseas as it relates to racism and being a black artist? Um, we'll start with Stacy with that. Well, um, I got a chance to see many, when I, when I went over to Europe first, I mean, my first destination was Holland. I got a chance to see other black people from all over the world. They were from France, Africa, England, Suriname. And the more I think about it, from their perspective, I, I could have been an immigrant or refugee from Africa. 
You know, they didn't know the difference until I opened my mouth and realized I had an American accent, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, me, used to, I used to live in Amsterdam, but there was one thing that really fucked me up is when I saw Black Pete. Mm -hmm. was, oh, me and the, you know, Black Pete, for those who don't know, it blew my mind. Black Pete was a, was a character dressed in blackface, developed from the history of Santa Claus and St. Nicholas. You know, he came from the North Pole, you know, with his reindeers and Black Pete, he came on a boat with black servants, you know. And when I found this, you know, and, and, the, and you know, the Dutch people, they pride themselves with being um, okay. you know, not, you know, tolerant and anti-racist people, you know, but for them to allow this, and it's, and it's you know, right now it's being, you know, discussed on being able to have this ban. But when I saw that, being from America and seeing that to this to the common day, that really blew my mind. And because I didn't, I didn't really know what to think. On it was a different type of racism, you know. Mm -hmm. and, so that was kind of what my what my experiences was. But coming from Detroit, you know, I still was able to. Um, I was still able to adapt a little because you know i was young enough i was just kind of getting in information and and being over there at that time you know all right seth let's talk about your experiences um because we were talking about this uh a little earlier i think yesterday when we were sort of going through some of the rehearsals and run through because uh there's an additional layer of culture even uh with our blackness there are different shades of blackness yeah and, uh, you as a lighter skin african-american you know, yeah, talk a little bit about that, your experiences, uh, not only here, but also abroad with that. I mean, I, it's kind of it's, it's kind of funny. I, I actually left uh, Detroit when I was 21 uh, to move to Berlin, right? And um, part of that was due to the fact that the accept. I think black artists have always had to leave America, I think, to really progress their, their careers, you know, whether it be jazz or or, you know, from James Baldwin and literature to anything, you know? And I think for a long time, I had left America in a way, almost trying to escape the, the fact that, you know, like, for example, like I, in Europe, I, I, I mean, I didn't feel like other, you know? It's kind of like there's this, uh, I don't know, especially like in England, like as Stacy said, it's like, okay, there's so many different black people from so many different places, right? that it wasn't like, oh, you're like black. It's like, oh, I'm African, you know, or like I'm from here. You know, it's, it's a lot more kind of culturally centered where I think there's a lot more classism in, in Europe. And mm -hmm. I just found a freedom that I never had in America, you know, but now with everything happening and going on, I've kind of in a way, like I'm going to, I'm, re I'm returning to America. I'm like, I'm going to move back here because like for so long, I kind of, ran away from what it was to be a black American and just was trying to be Seth out there and then forgot, I not, I mean, not forgot, but in many ways, I think like, um, this is how I want to, how do I want to put this? Yeah. In many ways, just try to forge my own way, just being a person and then forgetting about my history in, in some ways, you know, I, I have a, a label Tuskegee, which supports all black artists and, and other things, but still at the same time, I kind of ran away from the oppression you know, and kind of put it out of my mind, you know, by moving to Europe. And, you know, some things do exist, like Black Pete, you know, famously, where like everyone in Holland black faces themselves and then runs around in the streets, which is like, it's pretty insane. Wow, man. Wow. As a, it's super wild as, as, <laughs> as a black person. But yeah, it's, um, it was a, a, it's a far different experience for me, like moving over there. And like, it was something, it was, a, I, I felt a, a moment of freedom. I remember being in, um, in uh in berlin with uh like when i first moved there with huck you know god bless his his soul and yeah peace. Huck, yeah peace right? and that's right when i had had first moved over and we were freaking out about like how you don't have to always look over your back or just that general level of fear you know that reduction of fear with police with everything with kind of like how you're viewed how you looked at and he's like you know seth that here at night you know a woman could walk through the park and not have to look over their shoulders and do all these things. And that, that was something that like, I think as an artist lets you feel for the first time, just kind of in your own skin in a way, you know, where, I mean, especially being from the suburbs, I was always like either the token black guy 
or like in Detroit, not black enough. You know? So it was like, for me, there's always this situation where I was trying to figure out who I was and, and through a lot of, a lot of time and effort, you know, and I think especially now I've, I've definitely gone and ha also hanging out with my really black family more in Kalamazoo recently and reconnecting with them and my real father and everything. It's a, uh, mm -hmm. it's been a re, a, a reconnection with being a black American, you know, yeah. I think uh, very much so in Europe, there is a, a freedom of being a, a, a black man that we don't have in, in America, you know, mm -hmm. and that's, that's something that's our black women are just being black, you know, so that's, I, mean, I used to live in Dalston in London, which was like the Jamaican African center of the, the city. <laughs> and, it, and it was like, you know, it, but it's still what it was. It was about black culture and like African culture, Jamaican culture, but it wasn't the same connotations of, of being black in America, right? There's, there's a heaviness and a cultural identity that goes with that, that I, I don't think exists as much in America because there's less systematic oppression, you know? I think in England and other places, there's a lot more oppression uh, on class and, and also on, on different races. Like in Germany, if you're Turkish, you, you get a lot more uh, yeah. the same stuff that we feel here. Yeah. Or, you know, in, in England, you know, also there's so many different other I, it's all even like racism within the black community of other African countries, right? Like, right. That's the thing that always, that always kind of mess with me a little bit. They're like, oh, I fucking hate people from Cameroon. And you're just like, what? Right. <laughs> you know, like, you're black too, brother. Like, where I think in America, we have a cohesiveness of, of our blackness, where in Europe, it's kind of like, doesn't really matter. It's more about like what country you're from and this and that, you know, and people be like, oh, Haitians, like, you know, <laughs> like whatever. Well, yeah. There's a difference there. Absolutely. Now, before we go to our next question, I want to get a quick uh, thought from Carl, because uh, Carl, you've been sort of over there right out the gate in your career. Um, just what, what have, what's what been the biggest change that you've noted in just the way uh, America views black artists and then as they do overseas? What, what are the biggest differences that you've seen culturally and even uh, racist attitudes? Mm, well, um, like with with what Seth was saying, there there is, and I and it surprised me because there's a, a a friend who's a singer, and we were in a taxi in in London, and uh, she's Jamaican or West Indian, and there was a somebody who cut off the taxi cab or whatever who who uh, was a darker man. I didn't know what he was, and she jumped out the window. She's like. You African, blah, 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 blah. And, and, you know, I didn't understand, you know, the, the balance there. And I had said to her, like, you know, come on, we, we're all the same. You know, how are you going to play? How are you going to play it like this? Because this is where we come from in the U.S. It's just like, hey, you know, we all have this, this uh, uh, African descendant we're all african descendants you know whether you came over on a ship or whether you never touched never set a ship a uh, foot on a ship in your life so that was the first time when i realized that there was this you know this this uh a prejudice that that can happen within uh within a community of people who have have a uh, uh, brown skin but in the us uh, when the Italians came over, they got dogged. When the Irish came over, they got dogged. <laughs> you know, when the Polish came over, they got dogged. Mm -hmm. But the thing about those cultures is that they assimilated and then integrated into American culture as not being Polish, but being, you know, white. American. Mm -hmm. And it was like when you get a whole team of people together and they just gang up on, <laughs> yeah. on the people right. on this side, you know, like a whole group of jocks team up against the nerds over on that side, you know, mm -hmm. it becomes this, this kind of thing that that's, that's really horrible. Now from, uh, from me, uh, traveling, and I'm sure it's the same with stuff and with states and with minks that sometimes you're on a flight and you're the only only person of color on the flight. You know, it's just you on the flight. And I've never felt 
uh, anxiety or I've never felt any problems from that because I know that when you're flying, the rules are different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you yeah. know, that wow. when you're on that plane, the rules are are different to me. I don't know about yeah. with you guys, but for me, the rules are different. I don't have to worry about it because I'm sitting on the plane and I don't care. And I sat next to this woman who, I sat next to a woman who was living in uh, Detroit and she was Indian and Indian background. And she was uh, working for a company in the Comerica building. And we were just having a conversation and she says, yeah, you know, um, I have to drive through Detroit and I usually take take the Lodge Freeway from the building, uh, from my office to wherever she lived in West Bloomfield or something. She said, the freeway was closed off and I had to drive through Detroit and I was afraid for my life. Oh. I was like, woman, you in a car. <laughs> you are you're in your own own space you don't have to worry about anything just you know watch what you're doing you know i mean she thought like people were gonna jump out like zombies or something or it's gonna be like escape from new york or you know <laughs> it's just like insanity uh the concept that you can't feel that that you know that you come into this situation and you can't feel that you have some power in yourself that you're going to believe in in everything, whether it's her family that was saying it about it or whether it's coworkers or any of these people where all of a sudden she's just like, like losing her mind that she's going to end up getting, you know, accosted uh, mm -hmm. by driving down the wrong street, you know, just because there was a detour off the freeway. And, you know, that, that kind of thing is, is, is ridiculous, you know? Right. Um, so, it's and, also like media stereotypes, right? Absolutely. Oh, man. The perpetuation of media stereotypes of black people in America are far better than that in Europe, you know? And that's, you know, that's the thing. That you and she wasn't even about. trying to hide that it was, you know, that that she bought into these stereotypes and stuff. She wasn't even trying to, you know? And that's what we have in the U.S. We have people who, who don't reject the stereotypes. They just buy right into it because they sit in front of the TV all day mm -hmm. and their only uh, 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 outlet of information. They're, so they're, they're a source of reference. When yeah. they're only even dealing with people is mm -hmm. when they're at work or they go to the grocery store or whatever. And America is set up so that you go from one garage to another garage. You go from your part, your garage to the garage at the mall. Or you go from your garage to the garage at work, and there is no intermingling that really happens in between. Where in London, you know, you a lot of people ride the tube or they ride the bus, so there's more intermingling. Also, like a, a law in England that they have to have different income housing in every neighborhood, you know, and so that's like, great. Yeah, that, right. That's something that also kind of creates a social dynamic where people have to see visibly see each other to understand yep. each other. Like you can live in the the richest neighborhood, but there still has to be some lower income housing. Yeah, that, uh, kind of accommodates immigrants and other people. Right, so. and then we saw where that where that jumped with um, uh, the housing building that caught fire. Uh, oh yeah, at Glenfall Towers. Yes, we yeah. saw where where all the, the, the West West. started rearing out because the people who were living in the in the more expensive housing were upset because these people who lost their houses were getting replaced into their expensive housing, and then they were saying it was messing with their value and you know property value of their their uh, of their apartments, and they didn't want these. They were treating them like they were in, immigrants, you know, and they live right down the street, yeah. just in a different housing, you know. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's crazy how how these these things uh, happen in the world. It's unfortunate. Let's do some parallels here because um, with some of the social upheaval happening in the world today, one thing that we have been seeing is a, a newer generation, a younger generation kind of assuming or, or going to the forefront and assuming some leadership with what's going on in the world. Uh, let's sort of parallel that with the music aspect because mentorship has been a real big thing in techno music. And I think all of you on the panel here have been mentored uh, by someone with the movement. Uh, maybe we'll start off with you, Stacy. Let's talk about um, your mentorship. Who mentored you uh, when it came to your music and, and how, did, how was that sort of uh, 
uh, impetus for you to grow as an artist? Um, Mr. May, Derek May, man. I mean, <laughs> that guy, you know. Um, I think when when you know when I first met Derek, you know, I bought music to him on a cassette tape, and yeah. you know, this was me straight out of college, six months out of college. You know, I'm thinking, I'm like, okay, I want to have a record out by, um, by Christmas. You know, I, I brought my cassette tape to him, and you know, he was like, yeah, this is good, but you could do better. You know, mm -hmm. you know, of course, you know, it, it, when hindsight, when you're thinking about it now, you know, you it was for the better, but then when you know you have all this energy and you want to you want to sort of contribute to the, to the the world of music you know that um that, that that was going on at the time i wanted to be a part of i didn't know anybody so you know but as i as i grew older and you know i started um i think that me just being around the environment seeing that these guys wore t-shirts and blue jeans and traveled the world, was their own entrepreneur. You know, that for me was more of the drawing point that I wanted to get involved because, you know, I mean, I mean my dad, he was, you know, he was, he was a, mo a local Motown singer as well. So he sort of mentored me with music always being around in the house. You know, I mean, that's, that's, all, that's typical for, you know, black families growing up and everything, you know. But um, from from uh, also a men, uh, mentor point of view, it was um, just wanting to be around those guys and and you know those they be coming back and, and and giving us you know telling me stories about you know the touring and and the, you know the records that they bought and you know the the type of praise that they receive you know and that was for me that was more of the the. Uh, what I was looking for as a young up and coming artist, you know, cause I was always DJing, but when it came time for making music, it was all about the technical and more of developing myself as an artist. Mm -hmm. Minx, let's move to you because uh, you were sort of a late bloomer in uh, the, the music game, uh, but you were mentored as well. Now, how, in terms of you being African-American as well as a woman, producer and DJ, what was it like mentoring you and, and who, who did mentor you? Well, first off, there's a gentleman named Jerry the Cat. Well, his name is Gerald, but a lot of people know him as Jerry the Cat. Um, he was a best friend and he was the one that started uh, mentoring me. Now, I actually got into DJing because I would go to the Music Institute and see Derek May play. And he asked me, Derek asked me, why am I always, you know, watching him play in the booth? And I said, because I can do that, you know. <laughs> and I was just talking, you know, and I did say that. But um, when I went back the following week, he asked if I was DJing yet. And I said, no. And he said, well, don't come back in here until you're DJing. So that's when Jerry stepped in and said, well, you know what you got to do. And so they, um, he and another friend, you know, got together some turntables and brought them to me and gave me two records and told me to start. Mm -hmm. Yeah. mixing the tracks Get you know, busy. learn learn how to mix these tracks and i'm like well mm -hmm. how do i you know do that and he's like well if you can dance the two tracks playing at the same time you'll be good and then they left my apartment so it left me like that and it took me a couple of weeks but i finally you know got the two together yeah. and i called him and told him you know I'm, I'm ready you know i got these two tracks together he says oh i'll be over in a minute so he came and dropped off two records and left he didn't say a word to me he just dropped them off and left mix those and so the more tracks he gave me, the more I got into it. And so then um, the more I, I started DJing and getting out there, Moody Man started coming to see me oh. playing out. And, um, you know, I, I'd see him out in the crowd with his sunglasses on and he'd stay there for a little while and then he'd leave. And, and I wouldn't see him at the end of the night. But one night, um, God rest her soul, Laura Gavore gave a party. And I was there and he was there. And so he said, okay, it's time now. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's time for you to start your label. So like Stacy, I didn't know any of the technical stuff about trying to be a producer. You know, I, I thought it was ridiculous that he mentioned that. He's like, no, if you can play records, you can do production. And um, he told me to contact his office and you know, I'm gonna help you start your label. So he mentored me and helped me with that. And then came Kevin Saunderson. Um, with sharing my information with his agents. 
and telling them about me and um, what I needed to do to travel abroad. And that's when everything just picked up. But being a black woman in this, uh, as I said before, it was a bit difficult because this might be funny. Some people wondered if I was a man because I was doing a man's job. Right. So one guy was like, let me see your Adam's apple. Oh. And I said, well, let me, right. I'm not going to say, yeah. I'll say it back to right, him. Right, right, right. But, you know, it, it was really rough and it was deterring at first. And I totally felt like I was just going to step back and not even do it because it was just too much of a headache. But here's a mentor. Jerry is like, no, you're going to do it. You're doing it and you're going to keep doing it and you're going to grow and you're going to be big. So Jerry stuck by me through everything, like to this day. This is my best buddy. Um, but he helped quite a bit. Um, when I did get my first party and I didn't really have money or the direction in trying to be a promoter, um, I had some big name people step in and help me, you know, pay for some things. But a lot of people have helped me along the way. But it was it was really it was rough because being a woman and being black, it was just unheard of. You know, you look like a lady. You're wearing dresses and stuff, but we just never see these. So, you you know, that's when they were thinking, like, you're a drag queen or whatever. So, mm-hmm. wow. it was real. I just, you know, like, whatever. Yeah. I could still be cute and play my music. So, <laughs> I just had to overlook it. It took a bit, but, you know, I finally got through. Yeah. Can now, I can I make a, can I say something about that, though, real quick? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, this is part of the thing that, that, uh, that is, it dismays me to hear you say that because um, I would highly believe that most women DJs who are not black were not asked if they were drag queens. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm sure. Yeah. That yeah. it was, it was okay, you know, you're a tall woman, mm-hmm. but it's, it's unfortunate that it, you know, that these other women who are out here that are that are doing they're doing a good job out here right now, but that uh, that I don't I don't think any of them has, have gone through that kind of thing where, you know, they're going to be accused of being a drag queen because you know you're a tall woman DJ, you know, mm-hmm. and some people have that. Uh, that bias where they think just because a woman is black and she's doing a man's job that they have to mess with you even harder. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's yeah. really, really a shame. You know, it's really a shame. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Especially from a cultural understanding perspective, but maybe some of the social upheaval that's happening now will uh, create some dialogue like we're doing right now to uh, sort of address that. Right. Um, I want to pivot to. I just want to give one shout out to oh, Omar. Yeah. I just want to give one shout out to Omar us because he he was there for me at the very beginning, put my first record out when I was seventeen. Yeah. Taught me so much in the studio, yeah. and that was like so important to me. And like Omar, yeah. thank you. We still yeah. always in touch, and like I got so much love for that brother. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We'll take uh, both uh, Seth and Carl on this one because uh, we were talking about mentorship, and this is something that has been talked about in, in the techno community that it may not be quite as strong as it was back in the day. Seems like there there was some people have the impression or the perception that there was more of a communal spirit back in the day with mentoring artists, and those artists would sort of duplicate that process, but some would say that that doesn't necessarily uh, permeate the community today. How would you answer that? Maybe Carl, we'll start off with you on that one. In terms you gotta of- hit me with that again. Yeah, mentoring. Uh, some people think it doesn't exist in the techno community anymore. Oh. As far as grooming artists, and I mean, you had, you know, you had the big three mentoring you, um, but some say that we don't see that today. How would you answer that? I'm, I mean, they're definitely they're definitely people who are doing more uh, hands-on uh, mentoring, and uh, my my mentorship has been lower, I think, than Omar S. or or Kenny Dixon, or uh, or even Theo Parrish, because I think Theo I mentored uh, Kyle Hall, right? And uh, but you know, and I don't want to use this as an excuse, but it's a reality that I've been on the road since 1989. 
And, you know, everything had just kept getting more and more and more and more and more and more and more. So, um, you know, I tried, I try to be there for people when they want to know, but, you know, for me to, to do something like what, uh, what Mike Huckabee was doing at, um, at, at, uh, Youthville, you know, wasn't, wasn't really possible for me, for me to do, um, but with with Derek and and Kev, um, you know, from from my days of of you know starting out with Derek, uh, they always traded gear. There was always this network of you know, hey, I'm doing this track and I need a sampler. Let me borrow your Mirage, or you know, I'm I'm doing this. Let me oh, you got this new stuff. Let me check it out. You know, and it was always that kind of of uh, of of exchange that was going on. And that's something that I try to be involved with. If somebody needs something like Kyle came by and he took a whole bunch of gear, or Jay, Jay, um, uh, Jay Daniel came by and took a whole bunch of gear and it's like, okay, that's, you know, at least that's like maybe giving people a push to have a bit better gear, more professional things that they can try out. And then sometimes I even forget that I loaned out gear and it's just like, Oh man, what, what happened to this, this thing? Um, so, uh, I, I'm I lost my I lost my my uh, spot, sure. but but um, you know I oh yeah another person was actually Huckabee because Huckabee in the early days when he was just getting into it and he would call me up asking about how to use an MMT8 or use an HR16 or I think when he got his wave because he knew that I had uh, used the wave in Berlin, you know, to get him on the right point. And I've always tried to keep my door open and my phone on for people who need it, you know, some technical help. Yeah. And that's, that's about where I've been maybe more successful as a mentor is just the technical side of things uh, in comparison to, you know, actually getting, you know, some of these young guys up and running. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. How about you, Seth? Speaking from a millennial perspective, too, because you're sure. a little younger than me. Well, I'm guy. actually technically the last year of Gen X. Thank you. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Right. <laughs> yeah. just, made, just made the cut. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, it's kind of funny, you know, like I, I, I also, too, like Carl, especially having left Detroit, you know, um, so early on and having been in Europe now for like 13 years. Uh, mentorship's a different thing. Um, I mean, there's a lot of people who helped me along the way, like Matthew Johnson, Troy Pierce, other people in the same way as Carl saying, giving gear, doing other things. And I've helped a lot, a lot of people kind of behind the scenes. That's always been my thing is like trying to open doors for people whenever I can and help out whoever I can in, in, a, in a very quiet way. You know, I've actually helped a lot of big stars or people who become stars today and open the initial doors for them, you know? And mm -hmm. it's kind of like in a, in a back way because I see people who are talented and you do you can, can help. But like I say for Carl and like people like Stacy or on a greater mentor, or even, even Minx, I think you mentorship doesn't have to be personal, but it's also by example. You know, I think growing up in Detroit, the greatest mentorship I had was all the people around me and the stories everyone told me and the, the music history that you learn from people and being part of the Detroit community. I always said to other people that being from Detroit, it's like, it's, it's not the strong, it's like the craziest Petri, like hardest, like basically in Detroit, music knowledge is currency, right? Like a social currency in a way, you know, you can't really hang out in any, especially when I was so young being in the dance music scene at like 16, 17, trying to be around anyone. It's like, no one will take you seriously in Detroit if you don't know loads about the music, the, the, the uh, heritage and the culture. And then you around so many people who give you all these old stories. I think that really kind of drives you. I know when I was a kid, Omar and Malik and even Theo a little bit, like going to Omar's house and then them showing me stuff and like telling me things. And like, I mean, some lessons I should have listened to and sh other shit I didn't. You know, like, <laughs> when, you're, when you're a kid, you think you know everything. You know, and they're like, Seth, you should have done it this way. And then like, you know, 10, 15 years later, you're like, these motherfuckers are right. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, as I try to go off on that and do my own thing. Right, right. But I think the idea of, of mentorship, I mean, even with our label Tuskegee and like trying, it's just about at some point just trying to support other artists and just trying to open the door for people, I think in a way can, and give people advice when you can, you know, 
Like Carl, you've given me a lot of great advice. Stacy, you've given me advice also as well without even knowing it, you know? Right. That also when you, when you hold people in such a high esteem, you know, to, to your own um, lineage and story, any, 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 like, I mean, I remember for a long time, uh, Carl, Carl wouldn't accept me like a, like a redheaded stepchild. He was like, I don't know. <laughs> And then and Carl, Carl, <laughs> and then finally he's like, "Oh, Seth from he from Kalamazoo, uh, he from Lake Orion." Right? And then finally, finally, when I when I broke through the armor, it's been one of the most incredible relationships I, I've uh, experienced in electronic music and and a friendship and kind of like Uncle Carl, like you know, yeah. letting me know and tell me so many things that ha has been in, in many ways are through friendship and mentorship. You know, maybe I call it like a friend tour. Like <laughs> he's like a friend you know like fred tours to me i'm like hey. <laughs> you know so there, there's that many different ways i think mentorship can happen i mean and when you look at kyle hall and these guys it was it was very direct you know yeah and yeah. then they're they're very i mean i i was even on that path with omar and these guys and at one point he asked me to make a choice because i was hanging out with richie hart and kind of the techno berlin thing girls and all this thing and i was like you know, in college, I was like, "This is," you know. <laughs> right. other, before that, I was hanging out with Reggie Harrell, going to play at like. Oh my God! Uh, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, working at uh, working at uh, Melodies, like yeah. playing at like kind of Detroit art spaces and stuff. And I'm like, "It's cool," but everybody, like my parents' age, and I'm trying yeah, to, right. you know. Yeah. So like, back then, it was a, it was a bit different, you know. I think it, the age gap. Yeah. But um, it, it's I think it's something right now we should relook at and reexamine the idea of mentorship. I know there's a couple guys in England right now I've been keeping my eyes on Mason Maynard and Jaden, Jaden Thompson that kind of remind me of uh, Jamie Jones and I when we were kind of young and, and uh, they got a lot of talent and they're like young black kids that I try to help out and give them advice you know whenever I can and, and kind of give them a little a little push whenever we can it's it's uh, it's great to see and it's something that I think now with everything happening and also me getting a bit older is something I'm going to kind of dive into more and try to try to help more kind of visibly I guess. Yeah, being open for giving advice, I think, is is definitely really everything. important. But you know, with with Seth and and me, you know, uh, always putting him into the category of being from Kalamazoo. I mean, that's that's like you know, <laughs> you had to you had to pay your dues in the same way that we had to pay our dues because yeah. we were all very protective about Detroit. The legacy. That's, that's you know? just yeah. in us that we were protective about Detroit. So when when Richie blew up on the scene. You know, we were really protective about Detroit concerning that, you know, and it was there was a lot that Rich had to prove before, you know, we really accepted Rich and in, in, in our uh, in our fold, you know, and it, it's not only with technical people. I mean, I worked with a lot of jazz guys in the past and they're exactly the same, you know, so I mean, I'm really thankful that the, the, the legacy is guarded like that. And because it is, it is a heritage, and it's it is a true legacy, and to be able to be included in it, and part of that is something that should be cherished and guarded, you know. And to be part of this Detroit techno uh, mm -hmm. family and community is is something that is is historical. You know, we invented this culture and this music, this black music, and to be, a, you know, a black African African American, even in Europe from Kalamazoo or whatever, <laughs> to be included in part of this is so important. And I, I've especially told people that, that. especially now that it's global, you know. Yeah, exactly. You know? I mean, yeah. you know, we didn't know that it was going to be like this. We were just in our bedrooms making music, you know. Same, same. Yeah. Absolutely. And we're, you know, we're coming from, like, I I graduated from Cooley, you know, and I I wear it like a badge of honor. And I wear it like a badge of honor that I got kicked out of cast for not going to school and playing video games, you know. <laughs> but those are like straight up Detroit schools. And, right. you know, I wear that like, okay, you know what? So if you're going to say you're from Detroit, you got to prove somehow mm -hmm. that you paid your dues for being, you know, being part of the scene. So if you didn't grow up in Detroit, you got to pay your dues. You got to do it, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now let's talk about the blackness of the music because techno is a black music art form. Uh, roots, of course, in Detroit, Chicago on the house side. But when we talk about the historical narrative of techno, what is it that we can learn from and how do we respond to some of the inequities with the music? Because, you know, I was looking at a couple of uh, international uh, DJ mags 
And, you know, they were spotlighting various artists and very few of those house DJs were black and from Detroit or Chicago for that matter. Uh, how would you respond and just address some of the inequities in the music that the culture has been co-opted or whitewashed? You hear that dialogue, mm. is it true? Yeah, it is. I was facing with that. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, we had we had a good blueprint. You know, I mean, just like Carl said earlier. Earlier, just look at Barry Gordy and Motown. He was a visionary from the way that the, the way Motown was marketed, the Motown sound, the Detroit techno sound. Um, it was the way that the, the black artist was portrayed. You know, people will always have their opinion on you know if you have a younger artist and the artist don't know the, the history, but this is the way that, you know, we have been, as you know, we've continued to travel the world as ambassadors for the music, music. And, you know, we've basically you know, had to make it, uh, made an impact, you know, um, you know, in regards to, you know, the, 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 uh, the people on the, on the magazine covers, you know, I mean, that's, I don't really, I don't really, try to get wrapped up into all that, you know, because all we can do is from a Detroit perspective and a black music perspective is, you know, black music, you know, Detroit techno is a, is a, is a, is a culture right now, just like hip hop was, you know, mm -hmm. like I said, you know, we just sort of, um, you know, we just, we didn't know this, this was going to happen, you know? Yeah, and right. so once, once we sort of, you know, travel as an ambassadors and sort of took the world under our wings and, and did, I think, you know, I think that, you know, we never was really, you know, um, bothered by, you know, anybody trying to tell us, you know, what, what we could know, what, what we could do, you know. Mm -hmm. I have, what are your thoughts on that? I, I have one thing. I think partially, I think right now, like the, uh, not abandonment, but the, for, the forget, let's say the forgetfulness of culture, right? The, yeah. the further we moved away from the beginning of dance music culture and blowing up in England and, and Germany and, and all these things as something we created. The more generations that kind of came into dance music came in without knowing that story, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, yeah. I think, massive in the terms of whitewashing or kind of reappropriation of what dance music culture is. Like dance music in Europe kind of created its, we, it came from us, went there, and then they created a whole new whole new thing out of it. There's Euro dance, there's all this, all this other stuff that's not even close to what we what we kind of what you guys actually originally imagined and experienced or even what I experienced. And it's kind of I think right now is a critical moment in this kind of history and the re uh, the to take back what's kind of called the cultural narrative or the narrative of dance music that is ours because of so so long I mean there's so like even EDM happening, you know, all this stuff, all these different ways of kind of you know, re, like this is the, the you know dance sound of America, and it's like, or this is dance music, and it's like this has nothing to do with anything that's happened before. This got you know, I, I was quite vocal about that in, in the past, but I think like a lot of the kind of cultural narrative had been forgotten, and I think also being one of there's not so many of of me's also from Detroit. You know, there's a lot of people in your guys' generation. Let's say fourth, fifth wave. There's like Kyle, Jay, me. There's there's some not some young kids rising up, but it's like when you get less and also from Chicago, when you get less and less younger stars that come through the ranks to kind of reestablish that connection that this is a, a historical home, you know what I'm saying? Or the music does come from there, from these people. It's hard for people to remember that narrative in some ways, you know? And so it's, also, it's also because you know. of what, you know, is what most of the black artists or black people, they hear now, you know, they... You know, they think of music or techno music as being a white thing. A white really. thing, exactly. yeah. That's yeah. the thing. You know, and you know, you don't. They want to hear. They want to have lyrics. They want to have something that they can relate to. So they they just gravitate to what people, what most of the people who listen to. You know, what I, mean? I think they also like yeah. people generally want to be in an environment and around people who are like them. You know, so yeah. it's like for a lot of like black people in Detroit or other places. You don't really want to go. They don't really want to go to raves or go to this other thing. Cause it's a lot of like, like it's it's a very different cultural experience. You know, yeah, people on drugs. Yeah. You know, this kind of like whole thing. There's like yeah, this kind of funny YouTube of a black guy at this 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 music. But that's like it's like a meme, and he's like seeing all these like it's like different 
composites of really fucked up people at raves. And this yeah. black guy is like in the corner drinking, like, the fuck is going on in here? Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. But that's like, I think, I think that has a lot to do with also how, how few black people enter electronic music and feeling. I think there's a lot more people of color in the, the queer communities and like queer spaces and, and within house music and dance music. And that's always, that's, always been, we've always, that's always been ours. We, we, you know? Exactly, we've always been free spirited idealists who yeah. wanted to do something a little different from, from day one. You know I mean? That, yeah. doesn't, that doesn't happen overnight. No. You know, that's, that's grown into it, like we said earlier, and, and, and nurtured. Yeah, definitely. But I think now all right. with all these discussions, more people and more black people are going to wake up to the fact that I can also get into this, you know? Right. right. It's like we all said it kind of saved and changed our lives being able to, to travel the whole world because of dance music. And it, it'd be great to see a lot more young kids getting into it and then reclaiming the, uh, the narrative. Now, you guys, uh, like I know Carl, uh, he's been a, a promoter. He's a record label head in addition to being an artist and tastemaker. Talk about the roles that gatekeepers and promoters can sort of play in helping to um, sort of honor and embrace the, the blackness of techno music. Maybe we'll start off with Carl with that one. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. So mute. 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 You're, You're on mute. mute. I don't think Minx is getting enough uh, questions down there. We're... Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let, let's work with uh, this. But I'll, I'll just say that... Um, uh, the problem that I see is that, and uh, I'll mention one festival in particular, which is Time Warp, that uh, they, I don't know what they have, like 60 artists or 50 artists or something. And every year is pretty much the only people of color is Seth, Jamie, Carl Cox. Yeah. Uh, Martinez Brothers, yeah. and uh, and uh, Dubfire, and Local Dice. So we're talking about seven out of sixty, you know, and that goes to show you that in Germany they don't see this as being something that's a root, rooted from African American music, from Black music. They look at it as, you know. The people who are going to get get the 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 money through the door are going to be all these artists that are German or European, or whatever that have no uh, no um, relation to black black music. Uh, so that that just you know I think it's the promoter's job, of course, to stay in business and to give people what they want, but also to give people what the history. The history they have to they have to take the chance to give people what they need to have and to get them to understand uh, what what it's about because they have the possibility of breaking the next act anyway the next big act as far as you know Germany is concerned and uh, it just seems like like promoters are just trying to find the easy way out for whatever their market is. And if it wasn't for promoters taking risks in the beginning, I wouldn't be here doing what I'm doing now because I've played a lot of gigs uh, where, you know, there might've been a hundred people there and there should have been a thousand, you know, but they took the risk to do it. And that's, that's what, uh, what I feel is, is necessary, uh, the job for a promoter to do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I have to disagree with you on time work in the sense that it's kind of like a very much family-based thing. And, and Stefan and the crew there are possibly out of any promoters in, in Europe, the most open and kind of kind people, you know? Um, but I do agree with you in the sense that promoters have to take those risks and, you know, and be part of that situation. You know? Right. Time time more for you. Because um, they've really have... supported me and, like, I, I came up through Time Work. Yeah. I think it's a, a far more European-facing festival. Right. You know? Okay. Yeah, but on paper, when you look at when you look at that lineup, it's the same as if you look at Coachella. It's and also been the same. But, uh, uh, Time Warp's the same lineup for twenty five years. Like I think like one or two people come in every year. You know, it's not like it's it's for them. It's about those friends that they've made over the you know twenty five. They look years. after their own. 
That's yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, Which are seven people of color. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you know, we can all be friends and stuff, but we have to look at it a little bit deeper and then be able yeah, to say like, okay, you know, look, what what is this? You know, because I've been the only black guy playing at, <laughs> at clubs or at gigs or, or these kinds. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes when you go in and, you know, when you go from, uh, like at one point I was playing two or three gigs a night, you know, you don't even have time to pay any attention, you know, to, to the fact that you might be the only black guy in a lineup in Hungary or something, you know, or in the club. Go, go from there to another, another one. But, you know, it, it just screams. And I don't think it screams only to, to me. And I've, I've played, play time warp. I think only a couple of times I played with Luciano and I played, you know, maybe once as solo or something. Um, so uh, I I get it. You want to put on a party for your friends and stuff. I I get it. You want your kind of people, but and it could be said for all European festivals. So I'm mean, saying the Awakenings, Deck Mental, all these things. It's yeah. like none of them have black, like really have black people. You know, sure. <laughs> you can I'm you can look at some of those. yeah. You know, you can exactly. look at at a lineup. Of of even Spanish festivals where they might have uh, drum and bass, and maybe all the drum and bass artists might be black, but all the techno artists are I mean, minority. I mean, we can even look. I mean, I'm not trying to put movement on blast or anything, but we can even look at our own home city. It's like how often are black artists the headliners, or artists from Detroit the headliners at the main stage and at movement in Detroit? You know, in the past. 15 to 20 years, you know, it's, it's also, it's, I think it's a thing that I think all promoters around the world really need to look at and reassess and kind of bring back into the fold and, and, and look at that as they did with women, as they did with queer culture. And now yeah. it's kind of our time with black culture to reclaim what's kind of ours, you know? Yeah. It's always been our, our time. Yeah. It has always been our time. <laughs> It's been your time and it's also your platform. Let's talk a little bit about your respective platforms uh, and how that can be used as a way to sort of promote social advocacy. And going back to what uh, Minx was saying earlier, you know, some of the um, gender biases, uh, the cultural sensitivities that you experienced, how can you each use your respective uh, platforms to sort of uh, have a, a social or cultural advocacy, you know, and maybe promote and push a mindset that, you know, continues to uplift artists within techno music. We'll, we'll start off with Minx on that one. Well, I think you can use your social platforms by basically going through your music. I mean, like vocal. I mean, a lot of people don't like vocals, but mm -hmm. if you do, it's music out there that gives you an understanding of, you know, situations that we're in like right now. like. Yeah. Music speaks. So through music and uh, using your social media in a very tactful way, you can get definitely get messages across. Um, as a woman, it it's, you know, it's a little different for me than it is the guys because I'm like listening to everything that you guys are saying and uh, some of the things that you are, you all are offered that that's the same. That's not the same thing that comes my way. Mm -hmm. You know, things are a little mm -hmm. different for you as they are for me. Like, I'm like, okay, so I missed out on a lot, but um, I'm going to continue mentoring and, you know, doing my music and going through these social issues that we're having right now, which, which I'm thanking movement for, you know, actually giving us this platform because we Absolutely. definitely need that. We needed this conversation. Right. Um, long time coming mm -hmm. so we'll just keep i'll just keep pushing in that way you know we you know we've got a lot of respect from a lot of people that look up to us on a daily basis so we need to take advantage of that yeah just keep pushing. uh stacy how about you uh when it comes to your, your own social platform uh what are your thoughts on uh, ways to use that as an advocacy vehicle well i think that it's important for us to get the younger generation involved you know whether it's music and arts is very pivotal and very important for when i was growing up and it gives people it gives the, the younger kids something to look forward to just like carl was saying about 
you know, the kids that you, you feel when it was something about those kids face when they turned on the drum machine or when they f made their first beat, you know, it was, it was, you know, I'm sure it was a magical time for them, you know, and it reminded me about something about, you know, it's, it's good to align your yourself with like-minded people mm -hmm. to be able to raise the awareness and, and, and social awareness. You know, I mean, if I can't do it, then I'm going to put someone in place who's better at doing it for me or doing it, doing it for the community, which is important because, you know, sometimes people, they try, you know, people have a lot on their plate. They try to do so much, but, and it never gets fulfilled. You know, you if you sort of allocate it out a little and, and delegate it to certain people that, that, you know, as they say, stay in your own lane, but still, you know, um, branch out and, and, and get the message across more effectively, which is also important with your, your social platform. Okay. Uh, we're gonna go uh, kind of speed it up a little bit. And uh, this next question has to do with, you know, Detroit artists. Give me three artists each, three Detroit techno artists that are underrated that you feel they, they could use, they could use more push. Hmm. Who are, and they could be our favorite artists or artists that you, you really dig in their sound, but three artists each from Detroit. I mean, Marvin I think Prather. Anthony, oh, go for it, Nate, sorry. I'm sorry, Marvin Prather, Lorenzo Dubarry. Mm, do they have to be producers? No. <laughs> no, uh, they, don't, they don't have to be producers. Producer slash DJs, one or the other or both. Reginald, DJ Swan. Those three, okay. those three need to be looked at. They're great. Uh, what do you say, Seth? Um, lately, I've been talking a lot about Al Esther, and <laughs> I, I saw Al play the other last last movement, and it was phenomenal. You know, I'd like to see yeah. Minx over, and I'd like to see Kelly over a lot more as well. I mean, it's in Europe. There's so many people because it's kind of funny seeing, uh, you know, people talk about. You know, Ken Kyle, you're in Detroit. And I'm like, well, you don't know Al Esther. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and <laughs> you know, that, like there's there's so many stories and so many forgotten DJs. I don't even remember when I was uh, coming up in uh, in Europe and everything, feeling almost guilty that it was me, you know? Because I was like, I'm okay. But there's a lot of guys back home way better. I just, I just, yeah. I, just I was just the one who came here, you know? <laughs> like, I'm, I'm pretty good, but like, Back home, I was like, yo, there's some heat. I mean, it's great to see guys like Norm and, you know, and all these guys kind of come up and everybody else doing their thing. But there are so many hot young DJs. Oh, there was this girl I saw recent, uh, last year. I forgot her name. Really skinny, tall black girl. Crushing. Short hair. Short hair, yeah. Was it uh... Color hair, holographic? Holographic, yeah. Holographic. She was yeah. crushing it, you know, and there's yeah. like so many artists that we should push as well, you know? Mm -hmm. And the, the thing is the talent pool in Detroit is so strong. There's so many crazy good DJs that the world doesn't know that I hope that after this, a lot of more people wake up to. But Al, Al should get his turn. Everybody else is coming up. Al Al's the one guy who's been stuck in Detroit where I'm like, man, I saw him play at the, what is it, not TV Lounge, just like at Carl's party, actually at your party, he was playing, when we were all playing together, he was playing outside, I was like, damn. So, yeah, I, 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 how, I, how are you moving to damn energy blow? <laughs> Yo, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I have to jumping up and down. Yeah, I to, because Al, Al, back in the day, when, before I even started traveling, I heard Al play this E smooth mix of Michael Jackson. Remember the time? Mm. Man, like no he, other mix. Played, he played it like four times that night. You know, and most of the DJs now, you know, you, if you, you play at one time, that's it, you know, but, you know, it takes a, a, a real true DJ to play a track more than once. And when he did, it, it was just amazing, you know, but I would say Al as well, but also um, from, from a DJ's perspective, I like, I like YG, you know, Carl's been putting mm. him on. YG yeah. is, you know, every yeah. we played that we played a party together in, in, uh, in Chicago back in November or October. And I was there rocking behind him, and I was like, "Man, you know, he's like really going for it." Wasn't he in Slum Village? Yeah, 
He was That's awesome, man. Yeah, he did a lot yeah. of pr production with them. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, I would have to say my my boy Craig Douglas, man. I've been him. I've been oh, wow. knowing Craig. Wow. Douglas, I haven't heard that name in a minute. Yeah, man. Yeah. I used a couple of his tracks on um the Detroit Love compilation mm -hmm. uh, Volume mm -hmm. One. You know, I've been knowing Club Craig for more than twenty years as well. You know, and I heard he sent me just a bunch of music and. You know, I've always said, you know, it's, you know, he's, he's got some really good stuff out there. So those, those are my three. Mm -hmm. What do you say, Carl? Um, Gary Romalis. Yeah. He's somebody who, you know, a long time has been around, kind of got out of it, came back in. He's doing some really good records right now. I think he put some on Omar's label. Um, uh, Al Esther, of course, with Detroit Love, we always tried to bring Al Esther as much as we can. Al Esther is, uh, you know, I've, I've known him since Music Against Two Days and I knew him as a dancer, not as a DJ. And, you know, every ounce of what he had as a dancer was, was uh, is put into his music still. I mean, Al is older than I am. And, you know, it looks like he's a jackrabbit jumping around, you know, he's, <laughs> he just, he just and and you know those moves that he does and he, you know Detroit has this 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 uh, history especially with with uh, the guys that are a bit younger, uh, a bit um, yeah a little bit younger like Rick Wilhite and those guys who are cheerleaders for their own records so yeah. put a record on and woo 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 real right. <laughs> really right. Yeah. 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 Like yeah. And kind of another way. And he's just like he just puts it all all in. You know, he really he really does. Um one that another guy from that and I'm gonna add two more though, but mm -hmm. uh another guy, Mike Clark, you know. Yeah, wow. Uh, yeah, Mike yeah, Clark's yeah, been, Mike. Yeah, you know, he should be somebody who's definitely not overlooked. Mike is a great DJ and a great um and a great producer, excellent producer. Incredible but, man too. Mike is the best. Yeah, he's he's amazing. Mike is Mike is great and he makes a hell of a bong too. And uh <laughs> and, <Kung Fu> Master. Uh, <laughs> and uh the other one who's a a, a legend but uh you know, maybe hasn't been doing as much recently is is uh, Anthony Shakir Shake. Yeah, wow. yo, um, yo, I just talked so, with him this morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How's he doing these days? How, he's, he's I haven't seen Shake in a while. Well, he yeah. wasn't well for a bit, but yeah, I haven't gotten an update on him. Yeah, so yeah. hopefully yeah. He's, he's had, had some health there. challenges, but man, his music was yeah. wow, amazing. Wow, okay. wow. D Win. Wow, D -win. Right? yeah, D yeah. wins another one. Yeah, half mm -hmm. of our time with Derek May. Mm -hmm. our theme. Yeah, our time. Yeah. The best yeah. music, man. Wow. D win, I think, is Derek's favorite DJ. Yeah, he is. Yeah, he did say that. Okay, yeah, he's, he's Derek's baby, favorite DJ. Okay. Yeah, wow, yeah. yeah, like every time yeah. that Derek plays, he wants D win to play. That's like those no were the Friday nights at, at the Music uh -huh. Institute, those were the Friday nights, D win and Derek May. Yeah, uh, I saw De Derek light it up last year in Torino, like like mm -hmm. nothing I ever seen before. <laughs> like I, I, I slept, I forgot. I was like, "Damn, this is fucking good." You know, you're good when you're getting cussed at, huh? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Let's talk about this. This is a two part compound question, and this has to do with legacy. What do you want your musical as well as your social legacy to be? And then kind of talk about a project or two that you're working on that you're going to roll out soon. So for that, we're going to start with Minx on that. Hmm. Well, my legacy, I'd like to be um, remembered as a mentor because I mentored quite a few young ladies in my days. Um, that's when Women on Wax started. It started as a collective before it went to a label. Um, and I had also a DJ collective. So the members of that, I'd like them to remember me for that. And please remember how hard I made you dance because that, that's something that I aim for every time I get on the tables. Mm -hmm. um, and I showed you love no matter where I was and what day. I was always my feet on the ground. I'm gonna be a good person to you just like I am the next person. Ain't no superstar that can't love everybody. Mm. As far as when I'm what okay now, 
crown. So as far as what I'm working on, <laughs> as far as what I'm working on, I have like four EPs that are coming out. I've got some vinyl pressings coming. I'm got I've got an EP of myself. I am working with Gary Romales on some stuff. I'm cool. working with some vocalists as well. Mm-hmm. Wow. And I just opened my new online store called BehindTheGroove.com. So All right. got a lot of casual gear and I've got some stuff from Mahogany Music in there and some uh, Detroit Love and Kyle Craig stuff and um, some KMS pieces. Yeah. So you might want to check that out. That's Behind the Groove with a UV.com. All right. We'll move on to uh, Stacy. Um, my legacy. Um, my legacy would be a reflection of non-conforming, brilliant ideas. <laughs> you know, <laughs> put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> you know, and you made some records, that's for sure. Yeah. You know, this is, this is coming from a kid who grew up on the west side of Detroit. You know, I went through the Detroit public school system. Um, you know, a key, a kid who was easily driven and wanted to be different. You know, from the way I dressed, from the way I, you know, played music, different, you know. Um, you know, being an artist, we are able to tap into individuals that impact us and we have that we have to have the same same shared values that um that you know other people in music because that's you know, that's what the legacy is all about, is being able to, you know, have a a, a remembrance of, you know, how we impacted the world, you know. Um, as far as ideas and stuff, I mean, not, not ideas, but music, um, I have four, I have two EPs ready to go um, of um, new material that I've been, I sort of started um, before quarantine and I've sort of tweaked a little, you know, I I, I, I was always a person who liked to, to have, there we go. <laughs> All right. That was my one of my last albums that was based on jazz, and I was reading a lot of uh, John Coltrane and Miles Davis's uh, autobiographies at the time when I did that album right there that Carl was showing. Today is the tomorrow you were promised yesterday. I'm actually going to be re-releasing that as well as soon as I can get the rights back. You know, wow. it's a great album, definitely wow. classic. Thanks. Thank Thanks. So yeah. All right, Seth, how about you? What do you want your musical and your social legacy to be? Wow, I mean, it's I'm really at a, a place in my career having done so much, like number one DJ in the world, all this stuff of like really reassessing what I want that legacy to look like. I'm not actually really um, pushing kind of legacy work right now. I've kind of realized that maybe my greatest position in dance music, especially since I'm a little bit younger than the rest of y'all, is uh, you gonna stop saying that? <laughs> is 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 um being a custodian of trying to keep these ideas and this culture alive for the next you know thirty years or as long as I can try to keep these uh, ideas going you know and and really use my position in in uh, European dance music as well to bring other people up and open more doors and create more opportunities for more artists and and kind of take that role of of someone who's who's been an upper statesman even kind of young and, and and really use that as best as i can to position other artists to come up as well as create culturally interesting things in electronic music that expands the culture you know i'm working on some art stuff actually i've got a um we, we've been paused now because of the uh, kind of uh, the the movement that's happening now with the uh, george floyd murders but i have a, a piece coming up for the mocad that we're going to air live I did an art piece last year at the uh, Saatchi Gallery uh, during the first electronic music in London, the first electronic music showcase of art in a large gallery like that in the world. So yeah, I'm just kind of looking at trying to be more involved in uh, the actual art and artifice and, and kind of cultural, uh, what I want to say, like a museumship of, of uh, electronic music and um, letting kids know because like more than anything i want people to experience what i was able to experience you know and in, in clubs and through this culture and through this music and i've been very vocal uh against kind of uh, things that i feel are uh, misrepresentations let's say of electronic music so sometimes whitewashing of electronic music because there's so much um kind of uh how do i say this uh, 
so much history and so much pain and so much love, so much devotion that has gone into this culture. I'd like to see it continue and for people to continue with like, I, I saw someone like there's a difference between people putting out DJ tracks and people putting out electronic music, you know, and I think a lot black people have always put out electronic music rather than DJ tools, you know, and I'd like to see that culture continue. And I would like to see people understand that this music is, is real music. And it's not just about clubbing. It's not about going out and doing things and getting high. This is, this is a, a history and it's a story and it's a legacy that I, I would like to contribute to and make sure that it, it, it goes unchallenged. All right. And then lastly, Carl, what do you want your musical and your social legacy to be? Uh, well, my, my legacy is that um, I've worked at recreating myself constantly throughout my career uh, with, uh, within music by going outside of the boundaries of electronic music by making jazz uh, with legends, Detroit legends like Marcus Belgrave and Wendell Harrison. I got to tell you, that Detroit experiment, I bumped that this morning. Oh, Man, yo. So ahead of its time. Oh, my God. Yeah, that was, that was amazing to be able to do that. You know, Francisco Mora and, and uh, Benny Maupin, who I didn't realize was from Detroit, and Jerry Allen, uh, Regina Carter, just, just amazing. Kareem Riggins, just amazing. Any for a sequel? <laughs> I'm just gonna throw it out there. I'm just gonna throw it out for you. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, that would be pretty cool. That would be pretty cool. Kareem and I have been talking about doing some music for for a long time. Um, so you know, going into and uh, doing jazz, doing classical music. Um, uh, I've, I've, you know, I had a, a rap label at one time. Uh, I love rock, so at some point, maybe, maybe that'll be great to to pop into. Um, so, you know, that that I think is a, a major part of and an important part of of my legacy that I hope to continue is is that uh, that I'll have the ability to be free in that way musically. Um, and uh, you know, I've been fortunate enough to uh, be involved in the starting of, of the DMF, which turned into movement. Um, so that was another part of, of my legacy that has, has uh, you know, that stood the test of time. Um, and like Seth, I had a, a art project uh, that opened this this uh, spring at. Um, at Dia in Dia Beacon in in New York, and that's an amazing thing for me because you know one of one of the artists that was a big influence to me was Andy Warhol, and my piece is right underneath the Warhol, uh, one of the biggest Warhol collections that's uh, that's around. Um, so I'm I'm really happy to to do that. I don't know if that's going to be more art pieces that I'll do, but that is definitely a great um, introduction for me to do it. And, um, you know, the, the, the future, we continue to do our Detroit love parties. Um, and, you know, we are doing, uh, and, and I'm having a lot of fun with this right now. Uh, last week was the inaugura inaugurable, inauguration or whatever of, of vinyl freaks. <laughs> which uh, that's F R E E K, like the Detroit way of saying freak, freak of the week. <laughs> and, um, you know, friends come over and they bring records. Stacy and Minx came last week and played amazing music. And I love uh, the fact that, that we're doing this. We're going to do it again tomorrow. And uh, the, the objective is to play um vinyl without mixing and to play the music that has influenced you the most and um and and music that that you really feel uh uh, uh affinity to and uh i'm really excited about doing doing uh, uh things like this and this is right in my backyard too so we put on a nice system and we just do it in my backyard and we all just drink and eat hot dogs and, and listen to music and it's it's That's great. It.
You know, Carl, you get the, the red sausages, some hot lake sausages out. Oh boy, I got some red <laughs> hot for you, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> ah, it's great from Houston Market, the best. Oh, no, they good. They good. <laughs> All right, well, we're about ready to wrap this up. If there's uh, one takeaway that you want the audience that was viewing this conversation to just take away from what we discussed as it relates to uh, some of the historical aspects of techno. Uh, some of the social and cultural advocacy that uh, artists such as you, tastemakers and gatekeepers can can offer and contribute to the culture. What is one takeaway that you want our audience to sort of just walk away with from this conversation? We'll start with, uh, we'll start with Minx on this one. Ladies first. Ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Cool. What I need everyone to realize is uh, being uh, black is one thing, but being a black woman is just another uh, form of power. So it shouldn't be looked at in a negative way. Yeah. You feel like you want to get into this and make some music or rock some beats production and do some DJ and then you can do it. It just... Um, Get in touch with me because I, I'm still mentoring. I'm still I still have DJ daughters that I talk to every now and then and help them along the way. So um, you know any of the stuff that's happening now um, shouldn't interfere with your future. You just it's just going to make you stronger. So whatever is out there that you'd like to do, then you should put your foot down and actually do it. Until some people realize that you know. Black people are of a, a way of life as well, and it's still going to be some shit in the game. So you just got to look past that and do what you can to move forward because we all got to live right. And you got to be healthy. So keep yourself healthy while you try to go through whatever you're going through and be strong. Yeah. Well, they say health is wealth. So if one year taught us, if this year has taught us something, it taught us that uh, to keep our health up is of prime importance. Uh, switching over to Seth, uh, what is one takeaway that you want our audience uh, for today to sort of run away with from this convo? I think I think at the end of the day, um, it would just be great if more people got more informed of the heritage and histories of house and, and techno music and understanding where it came from. And for more promoters and festivals, uh, as Carl said, time where I'm going to have another conversation personally with Stefan for you. For you there, Carl. <laughs> I'm like, I mean, we already had a couple actually. I'm like, you know. but um, I think I think it's if this this has opened up a broader conversation of people just being more self aware. You know, like I don't think anyone, or I think largely throughout electronic music, um, most promoters, I say, you know, all promoters are are I don't think ever trying to go out of their way not to book black people to book women to book you know, uh, people of the queer culture, but through what we've seen already in uh, the, the past movements has happened, that just the realization that this is an, an, an issue, it changes uh, the whole conversation and allows people to start waking up again and being like, oh yeah, like maybe this is something that they forgot, you know? Um, so I, I think more than anything, it's it's kind of, I want the people watching this and, and you know, the promoters at home to remember, to think more about black artists, to, to understand that this is something that we are, are very uh, emotional towards and it's a, a heritage that we're trying to keep alive and going, you know, and, and prosper, you know, and it'd be great, you know, I'm, I'm gonna drop this question on movement for movement themselves to, you know, maybe assure that one of the headliners on, this, on the main stage every, every year closing the festival is a Detroit black artist, it would be great. You know, there's, there's many other places in other cities that also they um, can also start opening up more and thinking about working more black artists, not only from Detroit, but from around the whole world. I mean, there's so many great artists in England right now doing so many great things and, and really just trying to um, to push the needle and, and re-recognize the kind of cultural heritage of where dance music has come from and, uh, and where it's still kind of, uh, where it's still a beating heart. Mm -hmm. That's what's up. Yeah. Stacy. what about you? Um, what's your takeaway? Well, my takeaway would be to um, for people to remember, you know, we have such a strong foundation here in De in Detroit, you know, for black artists, for black culture, for the music, you know, 
its geographical location is in international waters, which is important because we, it's always been a hub of, you know, goods and, and, and people to migrate here from other different cities. And, you know, since the riots back in 68, you know, we still to this day are byproducts of that time. You know, we're still living and talking about it today, which is a very powerful that us that we can't forget those moments that we, you know, that shaped our lives. You know, we're still going through a lot of different, you know, obstacles and, you know, race relations to this day. So we, we cannot forget that, you know, we must stand tall, stand firm, and, you know, don't forget to, 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 to continue to, you know, protest on things that we really believe in. Mm -hmm. Right. And last word, Carl Craig. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's just a giggle. That's it. <laughs> well, I hope that that people who are watching this realize that we all love and respect each other in this forum here. We've known each other for a long time, but also that that should go outside of just our little circle here. We should always show respect to everyone. You know. It should be respect everyday life. You know, I mean, the concept that that uh, you open a door for a woman, that was like as a kid, that was always a thing. You open the door for, for a lady and let the lady out first, you know. I mean, and my mama still slap me if I don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, good parenting. <laughs> so that was a that was just a simple form of respect that we should have all been taught. Um, but I think many people have, have forgotten. And if we don't uh, practice respect, giving respect, then how can we try to earn respect ourselves? You know, you have to give respect to get respect. And we're at that time right now where there's not a lot of respect that's, that's given. And um, unfortunately, uh, bigotry and racism is as America as Chevrolet and apple pie. And that's just, that's just un, unheard of. It's just not nothing that it's, it's inhumane. It's very inhumane. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I said it yesterday during a conversation that we haven't recovered since Rodney King, that, we just kind of swept it under the rug. Everybody just kind of, it was big news and stuff, but you know, there was huge riots over Rodney King. And I just hope that what we're doing right now is not going to be the same where it's like we get on with our regular lives. And what Seth had said earlier about, you know, being caught in the pandemic and we're just like, you know, we don't have a way to distract to ourselves, ignore it anymore. Yeah. You know, that, mm -hmm. that it was, it's just like, the eruptions there because we're not going back to work. You know, we're not going out to the clubs or we're not going to the bars or anything like that. So, you know, the reaction was, was a lot stronger and needed to be happy and needed to happen. And I hope people remember these reactions and, and keep, keep it in the front of their mind that, you know, this is respect. We need to just give human respect the same way that we're giving respect to each other on how we're talking. You know, we could have had a whole forum, this 90 minutes that we've been on, we could have just been talking over each other and just telling the other one to shut up and do all this kind of stuff and trying to make our point be the point, of, you know, but we respect each other and we respect each other in a way that we listen to what each other had to say. and. You as a moderator, Chris, and you know, just giving you the chance to ask the questions, giving us the chance to to respond and and respond in a way that people will hopefully uh, uh, be will emulate in their in their own lives as well. Absolutely, well said, well said. And by the way, by the way, good job, Chris. Good job. Yeah, yeah. Good job. Incredible. thank you, Chris. Absolutely. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Well, uh, we had a great time. This has been, uh, we got to do this again sometime. I'm so glad. Right. Also, respect and thank you, Pax the Howard Movement, for hosting That's this. Right. Thank you guys. Yeah. So well, much. Thanks, Chuck, Sam, everybody, Jason. Yes. Really, yep. That's yep. great. Everything you do for electronic music in Detroit is really appreciated. Thank you guys. Good job. Yeah. Thank you. So,
kudos to Movement and Detroit Techno Foundation for making this happen. And kudos to the panel. You guys were great. You guys were fire. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, sometimes social change and artistic movement starts not with just one step or one action. Sometimes it just starts with one small conversation. So yeah, right. we appreciate yeah. all your insights. Yeah. All right. Incredible. All right. Thank you guys so right. much. Thank you. Thank you. Most love. Thank you everybody for tuning in. All right. All right, guys. Take care. Peace. Bye. Peace.